Hello everyone. Um, I'd like to first uh, introduce myself as chair. Uh, my name is Mark Webster. I'm Director of Information Services within the Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division and I welcome everyone today. And uh, as part of this seminar, I'd like to acknowledge uh, acknowledgement of country. So GeoScience Australia acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledges their continuing connection to land, waters, sky and community. We pay their respects to the people, the cultures and the elders past and present. So welcome, welcome to this seminar. Today, this will be Dr. Catherine Waltenberg who will be sharing the story of how experiencing and learning from failure was fundamental to the development of GeoInsight. It's gonna be a fascinating talk. We're all excited. The, uh, the, the title has intrigued us, so it's gonna be quite interesting. Uh, a bit of background, uh, Catherine Waltenberg is a geoscience project leader for GeoInsight. She has a strong science background, holding a PhD in geochronology, along with a decade of experience in the mineral system branch at Geoscience Australia. Catherine is deeply committed to enhancing the values of government geoscience data and discovering innovative methods to revitalise Geoscience Australia's extensive and continuing expansion of data archives, and we have a lot of it. Throughout GeoInsight, our current goal is to make geological information accessible to anyone who needs it, especially if they aren't a subject matter expert. This is going to be a great talk. I look forward to it. Sit back. It's all online, so this will be a little bit different in some respects. You can uh, ask questions through the Q&A area and we will answer those right at the end. Uh, I will now hand over to Catherine, so please join me in welcoming Catherine to the virtual podium. Thanks, Mark. And oh, thanks everyone for joining me. I'll just get rid of that little Teams pop up. Um, yeah, hello everyone. So today I'm going to be telling uh, my story, our story of failure and success um, that we uh, embarked upon as we um, work through the process of creating a new digital hub to provide geological insights to people who aren't geologists. In the process of doing this work, one of the things I'm most grateful for was the opportunity to learn more about this country and the connections that people have to the landscape all across Australia. So on the screen right now is a photo of one of the oldest human-made structures in the world, uh, Biomese Nanu, a network of river stones that are used to form ponds and channels to catch fish and are adaptable to the seasons and changing water levels. Um, and so as you look at this picture, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge country and those who care for country and acknowledge the role of First Nations people as the first innovators in Australia. I'd also personally like to thank those who share their knowledge of country as Auntie June Barker has done here with the story of Biomese Nanu, as I commit to listen and learn. So, Earlier this year, uh, me and the team uh, launched GeoInsight with, in its pilot form as part of the Exploring for the Future showcase this year. The intention of GeoInsight is to provide equitable, equitable access to geoscience information, particularly for people who um, aren't as familiar with geology and natural resources information. Um, we released it successfully. I did a talk um, explaining all about it and, and what you can do with it at the showcase. And there is a recording of that for who, those who are interested. Um, and more recently, we also were, um, I felt very grateful to win a, a good design award um, as part of the collaboration that we at Geoscience Australia did with Future Friendly in designing this whole thing. So something that um, a few people came up to me as I was preparing this talk said, uh, was um, you've been so successful, are you really the right person to talk about failure? And I suppose um, the whole point of this talk is that success needs failure um, to to work. Um, you know, there aren't, you know, Olympic athletes who get out there and just sit around and then one day decide to win gold or, you know, um, I heard recently, you know, there's a... Um, a phrase that goes around in, in the music sphere, you know, um, practice sounds bad. So um, the talk I did earlier was about what it is and what we can do. This talk is much more about um, the process that we went on to, to get to where we are now, um, why it is what it is, why it's not the things that it's not, and how we, how we made those decisions along the way. 
So I'm going to tell you a story with three parts, each of which I think capture a key feature of how failure played a part in the story of GeoInsight. First of all, I'm going to start with a definition. Um, I did look up a few dictionaries. They all had pretty um, boring definitions, but I really enjoyed this um, description of failure from Wikipedia. Uh, failure is the social concept of not meeting a desirable or intended objective and is usually viewed as the opposite of success. Um, I think I really like this phrase because uh, of the second part, usually viewed as the opposite of success. It seems like such an obvious thing, but what this statement does is it really captures that failure is not um, a universal law of the universe. Um, it's it's view, can be viewed as the opposite of success, but that's not necessarily the truth. Um, and that's that's kind of what I'm going to be getting into today. I also want to uh, just take a small pause here and acknowledge that not all failure is good. Some of it can be very bad. Uh, and not all environments are safe to fail in. So if you're feeling like um, this talk might not be for you, then you have my absolute permission to um, find something else to do for an hour. I, I absolutely won't be offended if if you're not quite in the right headspace to hear this talk. But I will say that I'm, I'm gonna be keeping it pretty light. Um, so I hope that you'll, you'll stick around for this story. Uh, part one, I'm gonna be talking about acceptance, which I think is a, a, a critical part of, of working with failure. So Geoscience Australia is, is pretty fantastic. We do a lot of amazing work and a lot of that gets showcased through this Wednesday seminar series. And I, I definitely encourage you to check out other um, talks in the series that are on YouTube um, to, to learn more about them. Um, there's some really fantastic um, stories out there about all those successes. But um, can, we, can we improve? Can we do things better? Well, of course we can, uh, but sometimes it does take courage to admit that. I think in our sphere of, of geoscience, first of all, you know, the natural world is, is wonderfully complex. We're always learning more about it. So of course we can always be making improvements with what we do um, and how we communicate it. Um, but we're also scientists. So that is just an embedded um, in the nature of their work is always trying new things, looking for improvements. So for the rest of the talk, I'll put these stars here to remind me to mention this. I'll be talking about the um, geological and natural resources aspect of the work we do, um, which is um, to do with resources and also water um, resources and, and good management of, of both, um, which is underpinned, of course, by um, um, you know, the, the culture that we have in the organisation and, and making sure that people are informed. Um, but I do have a habit of saying geoscience um, as an inclusive term. I just wanted to make clear that we're talking mainly about geological resources for this talk, rather than things like the beautiful remote sensing work that we do, for example. So I want to walk you through a little bit of a um, very, very simplified um, concept of um, the geological information ecosystem that we have at Geoscience Australia. Um, on the screen down the bottom, um, there's uh, uh, an arrow that is um, towards the right, increasing science complexity. So a lot of the work we do is um, technical geoscience experts, um, collecting data, analyzing it and delivering it for other experts. The person in this picture could be a uh, equally be someone who works at Geoscience Australia or someone that we're delivering the information to. Um, we also have um, functions that work to uh, educate and, and provide that, that basic understanding of the natural world and, and, and what you know Australia and the world is, is composed of. And in the middle, um, as illustrated by this um, rather generic photo, we, we have a, a, a range of uh, functions in between the two, which provide customized advice um, to, to people who need it. These are all relatively, um, you know, face-to-face -face kind of one-on-one -on -one interactions or one to a few. Um, there's also a range of digital um, systems that we use. Um, on the left, there's um, online classroom resources and other educational resources. On the right, we have our, um, a range of uh, data portals and, and such and publications and all kinds of things that deliver um, complex technical information to those who, who use it to make their um, decisions around 
um, Australia. Uh, as part of exploring for the future, there was a, a gap identified and that's where that blank spot is here. And that is um, the ability for people who are professionals, but not necessarily geo geoscientists with that technical background to understand our technical products, um, to, to get um, information in a kind of a self-serve digital fashion. And so the implications of this gap existing uh, that um, if, if you want to like use our online systems, you have to either go a lot simpler than you than you need or um, attempt to access your information through our technical products. Um, and often what happens is that um, you, you, you are forced to um, go through our uh, very competent and capable and um, wonderful advice teams to get that one on one inter in, um, advice. The issue with that is that that's not particularly um, sustainable as more and more people are seeking advice. So it puts a huge burden on, on, on those teams. So this gap in the middle, um, somewhere between um, educational and highly technical is where GeoInsight is positioned to um, fulfill a need. So we've identified what we wanna do. The next part of my talk is about learning. This is the longest part of my talk. Um, it's, I could say each of these parts are the most important part, but this is certainly the part that needs a lot of time uh, and, and um, the experience that we've had to really understand um, what we're trying to do and how we're going to approach it. So when we started um, looking at GeoInsight as a concept, this is the pitch that we made um, to, to get it kicked off internally. The, the ambition of it was to allow users easy access to scientific, economic and contextual information to provide understanding in a form that can be easily understood by a non-technical audience. And uh, alongside that came, I, I put this together, it's a, um, a mock-up of what it could look like. It's a, it's a concept um, to say like, here, here are the things that we're thinking that could be included. Um, at this point, I will say it. This is not what GeoInsight ended up looking like. Um, I'm not at this point going to explain why, because I hope that you'll come with me on this journey uh, and collect that information alongside me. Um, but some components of it. There's a, there's a brief overview at the top, um, and then there's a lot of space taken up by you know um, geological maps, cross sections, a stratigraphic column, and then down the bottom there's links off to say mineral resources, energy resources, etc. So that was one of the um, original concepts for what we were working towards. And as part of uh, the um, pitch, we wrote what was going to include. Um, you don't need to worry about the exact words here, although they're quite interesting to look at in retrospect. Um, the most important thing here is the mention of user-centric design. I wrote that because, of course, you want to um, design something for users and think about them along the way. But including that particular phrase um, triggered Clive Rossiter, who's here at GA, to say, you know, that's a methodology, right? Uh, and something that you can use to, to do this. And I was thinking, oh, thank goodness, because I wasn't, although I wanted to include users and, and their perspectives, I wasn't sure how to do it. So the fact that there are methodologies out there that you can use to guide the approach um, was uh, a fantastic relief to me, to be honest. So I jumped on board, I did a three-day training course in user-centered design through the APS Academy, and I learned enough to know that I didn't know nearly enough to be able to do this. So uh, at that stage, we did bring in some external help via the Future Friendly team, and you'll see them a bit later in this talk. Um, but to introduce the concept of human-centered design, as I said, it's a it's a methodology. Um, it's um, something. It's an approach that you use, um, which involves involves the people you're designing for at every stage. So um, this diagram that you see is. I took this from the Victor a Victorian government website, and I will say that human-centred design is something that a lot of Australian government agencies are really looking at doing more and more, and there's some fantastic resources out there um, for people who might be in a similar situation wanting to apply human-centred design for a government context. So this diagram takes you through um, the, the main steps of, of how to approach a human-centred design um, process. 
after you've decided what you want the future state to be, which is the, the first box, you then enter this, um, it's called a double diamond and the up and the, the broadening arrows indicate like brainstorming and idea collection and then the converging towards arrows um, indicate when you're trying to define things. So the first step is to make sure you're designing the right thing. Um, and it's an important step and something that sometimes gets overlooked. Um, so first, you know, we, we know we want everybody to access geoscience information, but what are the barriers? And at that point, it's really important to actually talk to users and find out what the barriers are. Um, because as we learned uh, um, throughout this project, sometimes you correctly assume and other times you've missed some really pretty critical things by making those assumptions. So I'll, t I'll explain some of that later. Then once you've gathered the information, you define the problem you're trying to solve. And then the next diamond is about designing that thing um, properly. So that's about um, testing prototypes again with users and then working out what works best and building that. So the actual building of the thing is, is a relatively small part of the entire process. Uh, and by doing this, you make sure that you're addressing the right problem. You can test ideas much cheaper and quicker than building a whole production line, um, production version, and then realizing it's not quite right. Um, you, you know, fail early on and then you improve. Um, it's also important to include people in the team who are across all the different various aspects. That includes um, for us, you know, science subject matter experts, but also, you know, people in the digital sphere who um, will need to implement it and a whole range of different skill sets. And it's fantastic for um, getting everyone talking to each other. It also helps build engagement and trust with users because you've spoken to them and it massively reduces the risk of having, a, a, I guess, a dud product at the end because you get the um, confidence along the way that you're building something that people want. So before we launch in this, I just want to, um, this is something that we um, learned throughout our journey, but it's important to define who is GeoInsight for, at least in a general sense. Um, it's, we, we interviewed a range of people, you know, people in federal, state, territory, government, um, people in policy, journalists, um, private industry people. And although there's a diversity of people out there, we found some common themes. Uh, these people who we hope will use GeoInsight are very busy. Um, they've got a lot going on, don't we all? Um, they have multifaceted problems. So they're not just trying to solve, for example, a geology problem. They're trying to figure out, you know, um, big picture like um, financial decisions, economic decisions, policy, um, land use challenges, that kind of thing. These people are not usually geoscientists, although you do find geoscientists um, all around the place if, if you're doing something like this. Uh, and the most important thing on this slide, I think, is uh, these people are experts in their own fields, whether they're working in an office or on country. Um, we must make sure that we respect that expertise, even if it's not in geoscience. You know, they could be economists, uh, policy experts, um, have the, a, a deep understanding already of, of country, that kind of thing. So um, that's an important aspect of this. So what are people trying to do? Um, and, and I'm going to put quotes in here. These are from people we interviewed. This first one here, it would be more about where the resources are. That would be where we would start. So what we learned from that um, is that people want information that directly relates to the problems they're working on. Uh, and we can pop the details in later. So what we're saying here is people, like if we if we compare back to the, the mock-up that I showed you to start with, um, people don't have the initial interest in looking at the, the geology and the cross section of the earth. They want to know where are the mines, where are the deposits that could be developed, um, where is future um, uh, things going to happen, you know, where's the best, best place to pop a road or um, what are the resources, and water resources in the area. And then um, so we've kind of with our mock up, we kind of had it a bit back to front. Um, so that was a pretty uh, immediate um, insight that we got from actually talking to people that our focus as geoscientists on making sure that we show our working um, is not the best approach necessarily. Um, so now that we kind of understand what people are trying to do, um, what are the barriers? Are there barriers? Have we assumed that there are barriers where they're not? Have we 
guessed the right ones. So the way that we tested this with our, our users, the professional non-geoscientists, was to um, uh, put them in a situation where they were using our current tools to achieve their work and, and see what their challenges were. So for this, uh, in this case, we tested against um, the data discovery portal and also a little bit about the data and publications catalog um, that we have at Geoscience Australia. And what did we, oh, yes, I knew I'd forget to say this, so I put it in red. Uh, a big caution, what I'm gonna say, um, please don't apply it more broadly. Um, the insights were targeted towards the user group who we're targeting, who are non um, geoscientists. If we were talking to a group of geoscientists about the same things, they would have probably quite different feedback. So please don't uh, broad brush apply what I'm about to show you to everything and say, oh, it's all a disaster. No, it's not. It's just not quite hitting the mark with this particular user group. So here's some feedback um, on how successful people are. They've said, a lot of the naming of the basins and geotechnical stuff throws me off. It just throws more expectation on top of the symbols and everything. Uh, there's a lot to be gained from those two sentences. We This is just a fraction of the feedback we got. Um, so there are other things that other people have said that support this, but basically, the technical level of the content that we have uh, in the data portal isn't appropriate for this um, sector of users. And so whatever we design in the box, I've got one of the foundational principles of GeoInsight. It must use plain language. It must avoid um, geoscience jargon, um, which is just our natural way of speaking and communicating as geoscientists, but it's quite unapproachable. And there's a little bit more in there as well about um, the difficulty with interpreting maps. Um, so um, here's another quote. Um, this one I think has had the highest impact on me personally and a few other people at Geoscience Australia. My boss doesn't understand a map unless I'm standing next to it explaining. So as someone who's, I guess, completely comfortable with spatial information and in a building with people, who are very comfortable with spatial information. Um, it was uh, very, very valuable to hear that not everybody's brains work like that, that there's a diversity of ways that people um, interpret information and a purely spatial approach is not going to um, hit the mark for everybody. Um, this might be a good point to remind people, as I said earlier, it's, it's not a matter of education. Um, a, a lot of people, I think every person we talked to were, were highly professional in their own field. It just happened that they didn't interpret, didn't take in necessarily information in, in the same way we did. And it's not across the board. The answer is not, let's no, have no maps. It's, um, as it says in that box, show content in a range of mediums for a range of different ways that people take in information. So by discovering the challenges and talking to particular users, we kind of um, zeroing in on the challenge we're trying to address. Here it is that Geoscience Australia has an extraordinary depth of information and data, but finding and using it can be complicated and confusing, which makes it difficult for people with not a lot of geoscience expertise to make use of our tools, data and information. And from that, we have the vision of what we want to um, work towards, which is an accessible experience that curates information and data from across the Geoscience Australia ecosystem, helping users make decisions and refine their research approach quickly and confidently. And we're starting down the bottom, you can see um, a, a few um, concepts emerging of, of how we're going to approach it by having simple topics and layers, quick searches um, based on regions and easy to interpret summaries of information. So as we move across this design um, pathway, um, we're up to now, we hadn't really been thinking about solutions, although it's a natural human <laughs> desire to, to try and problem solve along the way. This is the point where we start thinking, well, how can we address those concerns? And so what we did here was that we, we um, got users back to test a series of increasingly refined prototypes um, designed to really zero in on, on what would be most effective. We used them to investigate specific questions we had, like, do you prefer this or that? Um, is the, the amount of text too much or not enough? You know, that kind of thing. So um, that was really useful and was quite quick. 
um, in terms of uh, the amount of time it took because we're able to get immediate feedback and then spin up another iteration. Um, and from all this, we um, are zeroing in on the value proposition that GeoInsight offers uh, different to a data portal. And it's very important that we're not trying to build another data portal um, just for a different audience. It's actually got quite a different um, uh, approach. Um, I've forgotten the word, but you know, approach. So on the GeoInsight side, we're trying to give quick access to an overview of geoscience data versus an in-depth visual and spatial data exploration and analysis that you would get from a data portal. GeoInsight, a refined set of layers, portal, a complete set of layers, GeoInsight presets um, and pre-groups information so it's quicker. Data portals tend to be fully flexible, so you can do what you want um, to your heart's content. Um, GeoInsight, automated summaries, data snapshots, portal, full data, everything you could want. And then again, yeah, quick exports versus full data exports. And there's a spectrum of use cases where we expect that GeoInsight will get a less technical use case, whereas data portals would be a technical use case. And there is definitely um, a flow between these two as well. So um, as you can see, there's some quotes. Well, actually, these are not quotes. These are just ideas of what people might be thinking, depending on where they want to go. GeoInsight, give me a quick overview of an area I'm interested in versus a data portal, take me straight to the detail. And then in the middle, give me a summary. But I want to be able to do more detailed research. So there's that link between the two. And that's an important aspect of GeoInsight as well. It's not going to be. Um, the end point for most people. We want it to be a jumping off point into further research. And that's what this next slide is about. This is kind of a, con a visual concept of GeoInsight. And what we're doing um, is gathering up all the, the information, the context from across the broad breadth of everything Geoscience Australia offers, uh, and also potentially our, our, our collaborators and in other agencies so that people can easily discover um, what we have, they can understand the high level, what it's saying, and then provide pathways to continue um, to whichever next step is most appropriate. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, and as part of the design process, we got a range of different, uh, I guess, outputs from it. On the right, you can see, I guess, the final prototype version, um, which was what we were referencing as we built it. Um, but way more valuable than that is the principles on the left, some of which I talked to you already about, which really underpin our approach. And so even if the design changes, we want to make sure that we're still focusing on these foundational principles. Don't overload the functionality. Don't put everything in there. Use plain language so people can understand it. Use predefined regions. This one is a little bit trickier and I will get back to why, but basically um, having some got guardrails, as it says in that, makes it easier for people to make a choice and understand how to navigate. Um, showing content in a range of mediums, curating content with intent, making sure that everything in there is intentional and serves a purpose. And of course, remaining un impartial, unbiased and trusted. Um, it's, it's still about information rather than opinions. Um, we also developed a roadmap for how we were going to approach this. Um, there were three horizons identified, three different stages of development. We're just at the end of the first horizon uh, at the pilot stage. So there's still more to come and that's part of the ongoing plan. The key focus of the pilot stage was to deliver core functionality within the smallest viable range of data. Um, we did find that viable range of data meant different things to different people and I can talk a bit more about that. But um, Basically, it's hard to stop um, scientists from wanting to just add a little bit more. Um, but no, I think I'm very happy with where we are now. But I just wanted to flag that, you know, there's more to come in terms of both functionality and, and the information that we're providing. So it wasn't all straightforward. This all makes it sound like, yes, we had a plan and we knew exactly what we we're doing the whole way through. No, that's not true. It's actually a pretty tricky process. Um, it was fantastic to have the support of everybody to achieve it. Um, but I do want to talk through some of the challenges we had because I think it's it's really important um, to be aware of them. So the first uh, challenge is dealing with uncertainty. When you accept that you don't know the answers, 
and that you need to talk to users to find out what their challenges are. There is a period where you don't know what you're going to hear and therefore what you're going to be doing. And uncertainty is one of those deeply uncomfortable things for people to deal with. So some of the approaches we took to try and manage this is first of all, just to acknowledge that it will be uncomfortable. That's that's a kind of a built-in feature of human-centered design. Um, but another one is that if you're approaching it correctly, uh, trust the process because you will get clarity eventually just maybe not at the pace that you would hope um, and then you can always use the guiding star of the vision you know the high level goal of what you're trying to achieve to to, to kind of give confidence that you're on the right track um, we needed a safe space for trial and error we had to test our assumptions um, a lot of the time um, we had to check against what we heard from users and um, but it also had to be a safe place to to to, to propose ideas and, and have a discussion and that kind of thing so in this kind of work, the psychological safety of the team was really important, respecting each other's opinions. And I do strongly believe that the broader workplace culture kind of defines how successful you're going to be in that. So I feel very grateful to be working uh, within Geoscience Australia in the place that I was that I did feel like very, um, we had a lot of permission to be doing this. To, to be thinking outside the box and exploring ideas, um, which was fantastic because I don't think it could have worked without that culture. Um, the work itself was complex and multi-part. All the different topics of science we were trying to put in, the, te the technology, the build, um, the data management, uh, we were trying to make it so that the same information that the technical reports are built on also flows through in a simplified way to GeoInsight. We didn't get all the way there, but we certainly learned a lot along the way. Needless to say, and, and then all the design decisions that we had to make, do we include this or not? Does it go here or where? There was a lot going on. Um, the way that we uh, worked with that was to take a very iterative, iterative approach. Even with designing the content, you know, we were constantly reviewing and revising on about a fort, at least a fortnightly basis. Like, is this working? Is this is this going to be worth the effort at the end, or should we prioritize something else? We were constantly um, reviewing and, and making sure that we were on track to deliver a good a good product at the pilot stage, and of course, the right skills and tools. So, um, we need a lot of different tool skills um, and a lot of tools to help manage the work. Uh, we didn't have all of it in-house, so we got future friendly in the design team, and that was a really um, fantastic choice. So um, definitely uh, encourage if you if you're thinking of doing this, make sure that you've got people with you know user research and that kind of thing, that kind of experience, because it'll make a huge difference. Scope creep. Uh, it's the challenge of almost every project. Um, it's particularly challenging, I think when you're a subject matter expert trying to deliver simple information, there's always something more that you know that people could know and it's so tempting to pop it in. But um, it was really important to keep um, the workload manageable. So starting with a pilot release was part of that. And I'll say it over and over again, like pilot, 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 um, because we're not trying to put everything in um, to start with, that would be, um, overwhelming this way we we continue to build in the feedback that we need to say like is this good and people say yes but I'd like more or I'd prefer you to focus on something else it really helps guide that so that staged approach helps with that a little bit and this concept of minimum marketable product minimum viable product might be a phrase you're more familiar with that's you know the, the bare bones basic thing that you can get over the line uh, technically meet your um project requirements. Marketable product is a bit different. It's something that's a bit broad, more broadly appealing and um, it's something that's, um, I'm not an expert in this by the way, but it's it's something that um, people can see the value of and want to encourage you to continue. So it's a step above viable. Um, and always going back to testing against the value proposition. Um, so testing, is this something that we want or is it something that our users need? Um, we had a lot of those conversations, um, and and I think yeah, especially with the scope creep, if you can, if we can keep a handle on that, then a lot of these other challenges also become more manageable too. So, 
I had different pictures for you to look at while I was talking through all those, but I forgot about them. Um, GeoInsight, yes, as I said, it's it's a living product. You can jump on it now. It works on mobile and um, browser. I'm about to give you a live demo. Um, you're welcome to follow along if you like. Um, it'll just be a whirlwind trip for this time. And mainly I'm just going to show you how these insights we got from the users make their way into how we actually designed it. So let's, um, no, I'm confident this will work. Here we go. Here we go. There it is. So this is GeoInsight. If you followed that link, this is where you would end up. Um, this is the landing page. And so just again, a quick tour through it. We've put what we're trying to do at the front so people can see, is this for them? Um, and then there's a quick run through of the what you're to expect. So it's a very simple um, staged approach to get to the information you want. I'll jump across to the next page where I can show you how we simplified the um, feed, the the choices people need to make to get to the information that they want. Um, one of the challenges was there's just don't know where to start. There's there's too many choices. Here's here's two questions that that get you started. What what do you want to know about and whereabouts are you looking? So you can pick any of these topics as a starting point, although you're not bound to it, and then you can search. So we have some pre-canned regions. You can also use street addresses, although some very valuable feedback that we got in the more recent feedback session was that that doesn't really work very well in the Northern Territory because there aren't a lot of streets. So we'll look at other ways to um, work with that. Um, and then you've made your choice and you get to a page, there is a map. Um, but before I hop into all the, the detail of that, I just wanted to flag a couple of really important things. There is a help um, page on the left hand bar where you can get some help. And it also contains now our technical documentation because we got a lot of questions about how we actually put it together. Um, so, but if you've still got questions after you read through those, I'm very happy to have a chat. And very also, we have a way to provide feedback down the bottom. So please make use of, of that. If you have any comments, um, good or bad, I'm interested in all of it. So we've chosen minerals in the Tennant Creek region, and that's what we're seeing on the map. Uh, you can change the region just by typing in this box. You can change the topic by choosing something else from the drop dropdown. Um, directly under the topic, there's a little legend there. Um, we also provided a, a set of very basic um, infrastructure layers to help give context. Um, so for example, oil and gas pipelines, um, major roads, that kind of thing. Um, and on the map, it's just one layer for minerals. It's just the uh, mines and mineral deposits. And similarly for energy, it is um, energy production plants and mines. And for groundwater, it's groundwater um, regions. So if, again, if you're one of these people who don't think spatially, that's okay, because in the middle, um, there's a way to generate a report. You don't have to look at the map if you don't want to, but if you do, you're welcome to, to of course. Um, so you just choose whichever topics you want on and off, and then click the button, and you get a report. So this is where the non-spatial stuff is. So at the top, there's a summary. We've tried to um, We've popped that in because it's important to acknowledge that these places aren't just interesting for their resources, but also, you know, people um, live and thrive in these areas. And we wanted to make sure that we stay connected to that idea. In particular, we put a bit of work into a regional summary, which introduces some geology, but also talks about the connections of, of people to the country. So um, that's just a little bit of extra context for you. And then each topic, as you can see, has some tables, in this case for energy, you know, what's being produced in the area, um, what has potential um, from a geological perspective to be produced in the future. Um, there's that map again with a legend um, and various bits and pieces. Um, I don't have time to go through it all, but I did want to highlight that we've also included links out to other tools here that we think are very, um, the most um, interesting. To the, t to the kinds of things that we think people might want to go to, but we're always open to changing those and adding more. Some of the feedback we got um, was that people would like some more local data uh, or information. So um, I think 
looking towards the state and territory and local governments um, as, as jumping off points as well is something we should really think hard about doing. Um, for the water information, we already have links off to the Bureau of Meteorology, um, for example, because they're the custodian of water data. So it's definitely something we would want to explore. Anyway, like I said, um, it's a whirlwind tour, um, but hopefully you can see how the user, the, the information we got from people that we would like to use this system have made their way through to GeoInsight. Uh, so, um, just to kind of highlight again, like we're not trying to make this a system for everybody um, in every use case. We have specific, I guess, needs that we're trying to address with GeoInsight. And some of the feedback that we got from people as we were testing different prototypes with them really highlight this concept, I think. So people are starting to identify where they would actually make use of GeoInsight. And it's really interesting um, to me and I hope to you. So for example, using it in a meeting. So if they, <laughs> I can only imagine if someone gets asked a question in a meeting and they immediately need to like have an answer, you know, that's that's incredible. That's a lot quicker than as a data analyst, we might be working. Um, identifying is good for community engagement, um, something that they can use and their boss can use. Um, and then the bottom three quotes of this are actually from um, more geoscientists or people in that sphere. Um, so it's interesting that they're also identifying ways that they could use it. You know, you can look up information and see what else, see what else is out there, who else has been doing work. So I imagine that's someone from a, maybe an exploration company. Um, people producing technical reports using GeoInsight to deliver a high level summary and being useful as a, at a conference as an interactive tool. On the other side, you know, um, this is still very positive feedback and I'm happy to hear it. Um, this is enough for me. If I need more details, I would go on a different database. And that's something we want to be clear about. Like it's GeoInsight is not um, a replacement or a comp competitor for a data portal. It's, it's a different thing and they exist together in an ecosystem of tools people can use. <sighs> Part three, celebration. Um, the thing about an iterative, iterative approach, as I mentioned earlier, is what we did, is that you must remember you have to stop at some point and celebrating isn't as good an excuse as any. So um, we launched, we also um, won a Good Design Award. Here I am all frocked up with some of the future friendly team at the Good Design Awards this year. Um, very chuffed to be recognised by people who do design as a profession, that GeoInsight was something worthy of note. We didn't win the big award, I want to make that clear, that went to a surgical robot, um, but um, even to be in the same room as people who were inventing spacesuits and cars and, and some really fantastic um, infrastructure projects, it was just absolutely flattering. Um, so we won, not for GeoInsight itself, but for the design strategy that we applied to GeoInsight. You can see the criteria there, um, clarity of purpose, the process of design, the culture and leadership, understanding users, business model design, i.e. making it fit for purpose for the resources that we had at Geoscience Australia, innovation and impact. So impact, I think we scored a bit lower on, but that's because we submitted the um, application before we even released it. So that's not surprising, but yeah, absolutely chuffed with that. Um, a real testament to the way that we did it. And so um, thank you to everybody who was involved in making that a success. But we're not done. As I said before, we are at the first horizon of three and possibly more. Um, we have plenty of ways that we can expand, plenty of ways we can develop and what we did during Exploring for the Future is just the start. Um, we at Geoscience Australia has um, just embarked on the Resourcing Australia's Prosperity Program which um, is future looking and, and really um, bounced off the success of Exploring for the Future and GeoInsight is a, a big part of that. And, our um, strategy for delivering information who, to those who need it. So really looking forward to the future and, and, and what that could be. Uh, as well as the big plans 
really keen to con make a continuous um, improvement based on feedback. And so there is a survey link at the top right for anyone who wants to jump in and give feedback. Um, that, that link should work for everybody and it's anonymous. And all the questions are optional. Here's an example of something that we need to do um, as soon as possible. Um, this is a, the mines and mineral deposits map that we launched with for the pilot. We knew we wanted to revisit this. Um, it's based on an existing layer that we grabbed from the portal, but we knew we wanted to make something a bit more refined. Uh, it has been bumped up to the top of the priority list because of the feedback we received during recent sessions saying that it's not colorblind friendly. So thank you very much for the person who identified that um, because um, it's, it's really important. Um, as well as that, the symbology is way more compl complicated than we need um, for the um, primary information people are trying to get from this map. And we also know that people want to know what these points are. And right now you can't click or do anything with the points on the map. So coming in November next month, um, we're going to be updating it um, to look more like the one on the right. Um, we've simplified the symbology, we've made it colorblind friendly um, by um, in particular using more than just color to identify the different categories, but there's also only two categories now, operating mines and everything else. And if you're still interested in what the detail is, there's um, now gonna be, you can click on the link and, and you can go to a deposit summary if the mines and mineral deposits is something that you're particularly interested in. Very happy to take other suggestions on what we can improve. Um, so this is kind of me wrapping up now. Success versus failure. There were a lot of, th there was, there's what made it into GeoInsight and then there's everything else that didn't make it into GeoInsight. There were a lot of great ideas. There are a lot of fantastic ideas. Um, so the things that made it into GeoInsight are obviously success. Does that mean everything else was failure? Well, there's a couple of, there's nuance to this, of course. First of all, there are things on this list that will absolutely make it into GeoInsight. They just weren't doable within the pilot phase, but we're, we're looking very hard at how we could do it. Um, maybe they need some reworking and testing with users first, but definitely there are things that, suggestions that just aren't there yet, but will be in the future. So more of these ideas, a lot of them, all of them, I would say, are fantastic ideas. They're just not right for GeoInsight, for the people um, for the, that uh, we want to be using it, but they're fantastic. And I'm sure that a lot of these ideas will be developed as part of Resourcing Australia's prosperity. Um, possibly they'll be linked to from GeoInsight, but they won't be a core part of the, the functionality. So is it, are they all failures? No, of course they're not. We also learned a lot from them. This is what innovation looks like. You try ideas and they don't all work out for the exact use case. Um, and that, that's, that's fine, that's part of it. So um, with that, I think I'll, I'll wrap up here. I, I wanna thank everybody who contributed to the success of GeoInsight. Um, there were more than a hundred people, I'm sure, um, who, who contributed, including developers, data managers, subject matter experts, interviewees, reviewers, program support teams, managers and advocates. I have some special thanks there, um, but truly like there are so many people we could add to this list. Um, if you're interested, there's again, the URL for GeoInsight at the top QR code. There's that survey link again, if you wanted to um, provide some feedback and also a link to Resourcing Australia's Prosperity, which is kicking off. So, Thank you so much for listening.